Hello everyone, thank you for joining today's DOD environmental, environmental Planning and Conservation Webinar Series presentation. As a reminder, today's presentation will be recorded and then posted on the Cultural Resources Denex website under News and Outreach. Today's presenter is Matthew Grunwald, a Program Analyst and Tribal Re Liaison with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Tribal Nations Technical Center of Expertise. He will be discussing Tribal Engagement Handbook. We kindly ask that everyone hold all questions or comments for the end of the presentation. Following the presentation, we will have time for questions. Before we get started, please take a moment to make sure your phones or web browsers are on mute. And before we turn the presentation over to Matt, Miss Kate Pilton would like to say a few opening remarks. Kate. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're really excited to have um, today's webinar to talk about the tribal engagement guidebook for the lower 48. Um, we, as you guys can imagine, the scope for this project is pretty huge. And so um, we're really excited about this um, initial uh, guidebook, and we're really hoping that we can follow it on with specific guidebooks to Alaska, Hawaii, and other um, specific regions within the US. So um, we're really excited, and I just want to say thank you again for joining us. And then I'll go ahead and turn it on over to Matt Grunwald. Thanks so much. Over. Hello. Kate, am I coming through? Yes, you are, Matt. Very good. Well, everyone, just I'll introduce myself. My name is Matt Grunwald. Uh, I'm here actually stationed in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, on the campus of the University of Alabama, but I work for the Tribal Nations Technical Center of Expertise, uh, which is actually organized out of the Albuquerque district uh over there in new mexico uh so i'm over here in the east to help better serve communities across the uh country so i know some folks are still chiming in but it is 12 o'clock a little past so i'm going to go ahead and get started uh -oh. First, you know, we're going to run through this project. I want to talk a little bit about the methods and the team that was put together to accomplish this and uh, then go over some of the methods and some of the materials that were reviewed uh, to kind of show how this project came together. Uh, so uh, as we move through, we'll, we'll start at the very beginning with the inception of the project, the methods used to uh, bring the guidebook together, and then we're going to do a short uh, kind of just chapter by chapter review uh of the report uh just kind of hitting on some of the high uh notes of the report uh and uh you know with that being said i encourage everyone to please go and and get the guidebook and and take a look at it you know we're very proud of this project and are are very excited for people to see it um just to start i, I just would like to um know that this was a project that was done in cooperation uh, with the Center for Environmental Management uh, with Military Lands at Colorado State and the Tribal Nations Technical Center of Expertise, who kind of uh, uh, did the technical aspects and project management of this uh, legacy project. So now about the guidebook, you know, the DOD Tribal Protocols Guidebook uh, was created in partnership uh, not only with SEML and the TNTCX, but also with the DOD Legacy Resource Management Program. And then in cooperation with uh, USACE uh, Southwest Division, uh, Fort Worth District, who provided support on the uh, contract action at the actually the grant action and uh, the uh, kind of the uh, financial aspects of this project. You know, further, uh, I want to show this was definitely a team effort. Uh, here's just a list of the acknowledgments. This is the same list that can be found at the very beginning of the report. Uh, I want to uh, you know, acknowledge that the lead author uh, for this report was Mr. Michael Federoff with uh, Miss Ariana Kitchens also um, assisting on this in the writing of this report. Uh, we had contributors uh, from both within the TNTCX and the greater DOD. Uh, there was an entire project team put together at the TNTCX to address project management, organization, uh, scheduling, uh, financials, and also the technical aspects of this project, as well as our partners at SEML, 
uh, and OSD, as well as representatives from uh, several of the service branches. Uh, if you do note, my name is not on this list because I've come to this project in its later stages. I'm very happy and proud to present this uh, on behalf of the team, but just as a, a form of academic honesty, I, I want to let folks know uh, a lot of the language uh, that came from this report is, is coming directly from those who wrote the report, uh, which I, I was not included on. So I just want to uh, represent that I'm presenting on others' work. So who's the guidebook audience meant to be? Uh, you know, this guidebook uh, is to serve uh, to a DOD personnel who engage with federally recognized tribes in the process of meeting a federal trust responsibility. Uh, such personnel will include commanders, cultural resource professionals, natural resource professionals, tribal liaisons, legal counsel, public affairs and protocol staff, and more as their duties require. I'm sure we have many of those fields represented here uh, out there listening to this webinar right now. So the guidebook as a project, just to give you an overview, the project goal was to create a user friendly guidebook for DOD tribal engagement. Uh, the DOD guidebooks authors intended to provide DOD personnel with tools to successfully engage with federally recognized tribes by promoting compassionate and respectful approach to establishing and maintaining government to government relationships, effective management strategies of tribal resource under DOD's area of responsibility, and give some examples uh, as a uh, for consistent language in communication with federally recognized tribes. So the project scope of work was put out by legacy and here are some of the project tasks uh, that we uh, worked on. So first was to seek out information relevant to present day tribal communities, then create a tribal engagement guidebook, which includes relevant laws, regulations, DOD and military policies and tribal protocols. And then to create outreach materials to assist in the dissemination of the guidebook uh, uh, materials. Uh, this webinar you're watching right now is part of that third task. So we start from the very beginning. Uh, you know, this started with initial research, background research. Uh, the principal investigator and contributors reviewed over 200 documents for this project and identified 154 of those documents as related to the roles and responsibilities of staff assignments regarding tribal interaction. They identified five major types of data and bibliographic collections, which were aggregated into the following categories by document type. One being DOD agency guidance, protocols and regulations. Two, other agency guidance, protocols and regulations. Three, federal laws and their corresponding CFR publications and executive orders. And then related resources, specific references, tribal publications, uh, even some state uh, publications uh, were reviewed, and then five superseded guidance, protocols, and regulations. So there were some initial findings as the team was just in the very initial steps of putting this guidebook uh, together. Kate, are we good or should I pause for some folks to get online for the uh, for the audio? I see something going on in the chat. I think you're okay, Mike. I think it's just a, or sorry, Matt, <laughs> too many M names. Um, you're good to go. We're just gonna have folks call in if they have any concerns. And um, I think I just placed the number in there for folks who aren't able to make it. Okay, Roger that. Thank you, Kate. Uh, so, you know, at the very beginning, you know, the, a massive just, the effort it took to review these 200 documents, uh, putting them, categorizing them, and then uh, uh, gleaming what would be important for this guidebook was actually a huge part of this task. So here's some of the initial findings after that review of, of background information. Uh, the bulk of DoD protocols involve citing the purpose and need of tribal consultation. Rather than outlining detailed guidance on operationalizing tribal consultation goals. When detailed guidance is referenced, it is typically embedded over several different documents that require the reader to cross-reference. Rarely do DOD personnel who interact with tribal governments have specific position descriptions, skills, and trainings for those duties. 
And some DOD organizations, such as the Department of the Air Force, do outline roles and responsibilities for communication on tribal manners in their policies. However, details on operations are not always included. So while the bulk of DOD protocols focused on tribal consultation, uh, operationalizing and delivery of the federal trust responsibility at an installation level is often superficial at best. The most detailed guidance on tribal liaison best practices and tribal engagement are often found in outside agency documents, such as the U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Forest Service, and in underutilized uh, legacy products. So DOD offers few digital toolboxes and digital uh, footprints, dedicated web pages, social media, et cetera, aimed at effective tribal engagement methods and practices. So with that review of background research, it kind of guided the organization of this guidebook. And here I'll outline the chapters uh, for us just as an overview. So this guidebook is divided into five chapters with the intent of providing a comprehensive overview on the subject of DOD tribal engagement. While not ex exhaustive, the material within these pages highlights training tools and techniques available to DOD staff to improve tribal engagements in their respective areas. So it was split up into four uh, chapters with then appendices. So chapter one was sovereignty and trust. This introduces the project and the guidebook intent and defines tribal sovereignty and the federal trust responsibility in the context of working with tribal nations. Uh, chapter two, tribal liaison training and professional development. This outlines an example of a four year tribal liaison training program and offers relevant course recommendations. Now, chapter three, it summarized as a uh, collaboration, consultation, and coordination, three different forms of communication. So here it outlines these three different uh, communication methods uh, that are used when engaging tribes. Chapter four, conducting tribal engagement, provides best practices for formal government-to-government -government tribal consultation. So now, in addition to the uh, chapters, uh, you know, often we find with these guidebooks, the appendices are just as important, if if not more so, uh, at times. Uh, so Appendix A is a Tribal Protocol Protocols Guidebook Cross Reference List. This will give uh, readers uh, a listing of the materials that were reviewed uh, for this project, uh, which will allow folks to independently pull any specific uh, references that they need in their duties. Uh, so it's a really nice resource to have in one place. Uh, Appendix B is a sample memorandum of understanding. This is for engagement uh, to collaborate, consult, and coordinate, uh, persuading to appropriate federal acts and orders. Uh, this is a product that we're hoping, uh, you know, it's just a, a recommendation and, uh, you know, a go by, if you will. Uh, for uh, folks at the installation level to put together an initial memorandum of understanding to work with their uh, uh, tribal partners. Appendix C is uh, federal laws, executive orders, and DOD policies for consultation and cultural resource management. Uh, this is a quick reference uh, a guide uh, listing uh, pertinent federal laws and EOs, as well as corresponding DOD policies, instructions, and guidance. Uh, it, it's it's very nice. It's is on two pages and it's organized uh, by service branch. Uh, I, I feel like this is going to be a very useful item for folks out there in the field. Appendix D is a guidance document uh, or guidance documents published by other agencies. Uh, this is largely a list, but a short synopsis has been offered, uh, which will hopefully help readers of the guidebook uh, see if maybe some of these other agency uh, um, documents may be helpful for them in their work or their further professional development. So there's a, a nice, just a couple paragraph synopsis of what that document entails. So hopefully this will uh, allow folks to be able to grab additional resources um, as they would like. And then Appendix E is a regional uh, tribal co coalitions. This is a listing of tribal organizations by BIA regions with uh, corresponding maps. All right, so now we'll get into just kind of a brief discussion on what's contained uh, by chapter of the guidebook. So chapter one uh, is really sovereignty and trust, and this is here to outline 
uh, are really the foundations of the relationships between the federal government and uh, uh, tribal nations. Uh, this is going to be a very helpful resource, I think, for practitioners uh, that may be reporting to leaders who this might not necessarily uh, be their area of expertise. And it will also be helpful to folks who are just now entering uh, kind of the tribal liaison uh, community uh, at large. So it just covers your basics. You know, what is tribal sovereignty? How is it established? And what does this mean for DOD installation managers? And then the federal trust responsibility. You know, what is federal trust responsibility? What are the origins? And how can DOD be better stewards of its responsibilities? So here I've just kind of pulled some uh, of, of, of the points uh, to kind of give a sample and a preview for those who haven't read the guidebook yet. So uh, I'm going to run through these uh, just to give a sample of what you're going to encounter as you work through the guidebook. So, you know, tribal sovereignty, it's rooted in the U.S. Constitution and has been reaffirmed through legal precedents. And here we've got all the EOs and legal cases in there uh, that, you know, practitioners can, can point out and, and go pull the original decisions themselves and EOs, uh, you know, for their professional development. But it's also very helpful for uh, showing non-practitioners as well the foundation of, of tribal sovereignty. So uh, together with the Constitution and tribal treaties, uh, recognize the inherent sovereignty of tribal nations as governments pre-existing the U.S. and with pre-existing powers. Uh, sovereignty mandates that decisions affecting tribes and their resources must be made with tribal participation and input. This means that installation managers must engage tribes with cultural or historic ties to the DOD managed land to consult about projects, preferably from the initial phases of those projects. And uh, also uh, want to point out some other uh, some other relationships that exist, uh, you know, for tribes that may be outside or, or may no longer be physically living in the area of a, a particular installation. So in areas of the country, uh, such as the southeast, you know, many tribes were moved from their traditional homes and resources. Although no longer living in their traditional homelands, removed tribes still have the same rights as those uh, resources as tribe tribal entities that do still reside in their prospective homelands. So that's to kind of show that tribal engagement goes uh, beyond the tribes that are, are still physically present, but also includes uh, tribes that once had uh, a presence in that area or still have a connection to that area uh, through uh, treaties or other historic use. So the federal trust responsibility, you know, the federal Indian trust responsibility, you know, it's most commonly referred to as the federal trust responsibility in this guidebook and elsewhere. Uh, it's the cornerstone of government to government relationships. Uh, it is a legal obligation under which the U.S. has charged itself with moral obligations of the highest responsibility and trust towards tribes. This obligation was first discussed by Chief Justice John Marshall in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Over the years, the trust doctrine has been at the center of numerous Supreme Court cases, making it one of the most important principles in federal Indian law. And again, we have the, the resources included in there so folks can um, pull those cases themselves uh, and also uh, uh, you know, provide that to, um, to you know, any non-practitioners that may need it. Uh, so this is just a, a, a identifying a couple of other items that are included in Chapter 1. There are others, but for the sake of this, it's kind of a, a preview and overview. Uh, I wanted to mention that, you know, federal Indian law is, is discussed uh, in this guidebook. You know, federal Indian law involves a distinct body of law that relates to the legal relationships between the federal government and Indian tribes. Uh, you know, there are approximately 400 tribal justice systems throughout the U.S., and uh, identifies uh, a federal Indian law identifies relationships between the federal, state, and tribal governments for both civil and criminal jurisdiction. So uh, background information, and, and it goes into more detail in the guidebook itself. Uh, there's also a brief discussion in the guidebook on traditional cultural property and uh, sacred sites. Uh, you know, TCP is defined by the National Park Service as a property of cultural, religious, and or historical significance uh, 
to existing communities while also being of importance to the population's current cultural continuity. Sacred sites are sites located on federal or federally managed lands and have ties to tribal religious beliefs. Uh, both of these types of resources may be located on your particular installation and may come up as you engage with your tribes. So defining these, uh, um, these types of sites, these types of places was uh, put in the guidebook to try to assist folks at the installation uh, level to know what uh, some items that tribes may be interested in at your installation or within your AOR. So chapter two, uh, tribal uh, liaison training and professional development. Uh, you know, one of the hallmarks of the DOD's high performance standards is its investment in training and professional development. This is evident in the professional bearing and technical proficiency of DOD staff serving in both military and civilian occupations. This same level of investment on the individual level must be made in training installation staff who regularly interact or collaborate with tribes. So, you know, going through all this background research being tribal liaisons and and working in this community of practice you know the tntcx and and the team that put this report together you know realized that tribal liaisons are faced with unique circumstances to be successful tls should be adequately trained in areas such as cultural competency relevant legislation policy and guidance cross-cultural communication indigenous knowledge, collaboration, and consultation. You know, one of the findings of this chapter is there, there is no one size fits all. So these are really offered as recommendations uh, to uh, installation uh, personnel who work uh, with tribes. Uh, you know, every year people come and ask, so what, what are your training needs for the year? So this chapter is really trying to help both people on the working level and then leadership identify training opportunities uh, for tribal liaisons. Uh, you know, so this chapter provides some actionable recommendations in the following areas. Uh, there's a sample four year training plan uh, provided for TLs. There's a listing of recommended training courses offered, you know, throughout government. Uh, and then also there is some discussion on, you know, what is what does the professional development for a tribal liaison uh, look like? So, uh, you know, we're hoping this is a very helpful resource uh, as, as folks develop, uh, uh, you know, staff, you know, professionally to better serve tribal communities. So chapter three, uh, you know, we're now kind of getting into, uh, you know, the focus of this guidebook. You know, we've got uh, chapter three, the, uh, the it's a collaboration, consultation and coordination, the three different forms of communication. Uh, one thing that's done in this chapter is we run through the ladders of participation, as you can see uh, on the right side of your screen, uh, you know, where we're looking at the, the lowest form of participation, you know, which is to inform. Then you move up to consultation, partnership, joint decision making, and then at the highest rung would be indigenous control. Now, this is on a DOD facility. Of course, this is always done in, uh, you know, partnership and cooperation with the installation. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of opportunities uh, for co-management uh, on both environmental and cultural resources uh, side with uh, indigenous communities who have, um, you know, built up their own staff in those fields, as well as having, uh, you know, their own uh, traditional ecological knowledge, uh, you know, to assist DOD uh, land managers. So we'll just focus, we, they go into to much greater detail in the report itself, but, you know, just to go over the general definitions of this chapter, you know, collaboration is working equally with uh, a tribe toward a shared goal or decision of value uh, to all parties. Uh, consultation, uh, you know, that's a two-way conversation between the tribes and the federal agency official in which the tribal input is sought concerning a federal undertaking or activity prior to decisions related to that activity. And then the lowest form of uh, uh, communication uh, 
would be your just coordination. And this is an interaction with a tribe for the purpose of aligning people and resources towards a common action, activity, or effort. So since collaboration is the ideal, I decided we decided to include the definition for collaboration uh, in this. The other uh, um, consultation and coordination are defined in the guidebook itself, along with helps, uh, helpful tips uh, for each level of communication. So uh, collaboration is then an ideal in practice that can adopt based on a continuum of tribal interaction. Further collaboration can be conducted at different scales, both in level of effort and duration. Successful collaboration requires a long-term commitment to developing relationships with indigenous and descendant communities in the installation AOR. And this takes time, a concept in which indigenous and Western perspectives often ontologically diverge. Difference in language, custom traditions, and beliefs must be respected and considered as this relationship develops. So again, the guidebook goes into much greater uh, detail on uh, you know these uh, three forms of uh, uh, consultation and communication. So chapter four, uh, this is where the guidebook offers guidance uh, and recommendations really uh, on conducting tribal engagement. You know, tribal consultation, you've got formal government to government consultation versus informal consultation. The importance of conducting a tribal engagement in an important. In uh, the importance of conducting a tribal engagement in a proper and respectful way cannot be overstated and co planning and co development of agenda items. Again, there's no one size fits all to consultation. It's going to be unique to where you are at at an installation level uh, with your tribal partners. And, uh, uh, you know, it's got to be particular to the uh, situation and the point of the relationship you're at. So, you know, there's some helpful, you know, kind of guidance uh, and I keep referring to this as guidance please know that that none of this is, is being mandated Th this is just being offered as a best practices and a a way to assist people on the installation level on how to um, work with their tribal communities so what's offered we've got scheduling and organizing a uh, consultation so what does it take to do that uh, it offers tips on co-developing agendas you know, learn about the history of previous consultations before you start and then be aware of any hot topic issues that may come up. You know, a lot of times uh, the federal government, we may want to talk about a particular item, a particular project, a particular compliance action with the tribe or the tribe's not ready to talk about that yet. Uh, there are some items that have remained unresolved or we're just now beginning this relationship. So knowing that beforehand will lead to a more successful tribal engagement. So an example of a DOD consultation invitation letter is also provided. So how do you make that initial contact with the tribe? There's a sample letter provided. And then uh, meeting etiquette. Again, these are just a couple of the examples. The guidebook goes into much further detail. Uh, you know, actively listening and do not interrupt. Uh, learn about the tribe and avoid patronizing language. You know, action items uh, after the initial engagement. You know, there needs to be follow up after the engagement. Develop SOPs or MOUs between the installation and the tribe to help lead to better and more consistent communication. And then there's also recommendations for consultations with multiple uh, tribes, because sometimes, you know, tribal uh, engagement may be done with multiple tribes at the same time, as opposed to an individual engagement. So, you know, the outcomes for this guidebook, you know, it was the project team's aspiration that this guidebook will assist DOD staff in developing effective strategies to meet the federal government's trust responsibility to Indian tribes. You know, this is done by developing collaborative relationships with the tribes. And that's going to lead to more effective project planning, positive mission outcomes, and less project delays. Because the more we communicate, the more we bring our tribal partners in at the beginning, uh, uh, the um, you know the better this process will be. So you know that's my overview of the guidebook. I also also want to let folks know uh, that. Uh, 
many of the service branches offered case studies, which are highlighted throughout the guidebook, which um, uh, can be really helpful. And, and you guys will probably find uh, you're, you have been in or will be entering into similar situations. So it's just very good uh, lessons learned. Uh, so in, in the future, you know, if, if uh, you know, contact on this at the TNTCX, you know, I'm here as the program analyst and, and I can help you get in contact with, um, you know, some of the project team that worked on this, if you have any technical questions. And then also we've got Amanda Wallander over at the uh, uh, Center for Environmental Management at Colorado State University, who is also uh, one of the, um, you know, co-project leads on this project. Thank you, Matt. Um, I, I encourage anybody, if you want to come off a of mute, to ask uh, Matt or Kate some questions. Um, okay, we've already got some in. Uh, could you provide a link to where the webinar is, or webinar and the guide will be posted? The web. I'm going to put a link uh, for the webinar in the thing in the chat. The uh, um guidebook will also be posted there and i'll have to get that in just a second um did any tribes collaborate or provide any feedback with the development of this guidebook uh, sure Th there's a full list of the technical reviewers on the first page of the guidebook uh, i know that there were a few um in sorry something just moved on my desk <laughs> um a shelf fell down um so I know there were a few indigenous um, uh, uh, folks on the technical review. Uh, there were also some indigenous members that worked on the team as well uh, as we put this together. Uh, I know that Legacy has um, thought about future projects would be, uh, you know, to engage in additional uh, communication and coordination uh, on this um, guidebook itself in the future. Kate, is that answer that from your perspective yeah i mean i think so i think like you said um this is a huge huge effort and um a big project and you can't get um uh everything in one go and so the goal was for this to be our initial step forward and then to move forward again with a, a more specific more detailed um that can either address regions or concerns um but yeah i think uh we're gonna work with legacy legacy to see if we can um uh, get some projects. Uh, we're certainly interested in doing so over. Some uh, some of the uh, in attendees are asking if there are going to be hard copies available of the of the guidebook. Um, if there's interest, I think it's something that we can look at. Uh, in general, we haven't printed any for a while, but mostly just because there hasn't been a, a, a request for it. But it's something that I'm certainly if folks are, are 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 keen to do that, then we can look into that for sure. So I can take the name of that questionnaire and, and see what we can do. Uh, I will say, you know, this guidebook was also reviewed by, um, you know, all the surface branches. It's been presented to the HIPWIG. Uh, so th there has been a lot of technical review um, conducted on the guidebook to this point. Over. Christine, if you want to come off of mute, you're more than welcome to ask your question. Let's see, can you guys hear me OK? Yes, ma'am. OK, um, thanks for uh, doing this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, my question is just um, with the getting this guidebook sort of out to outside of CRMs, um, and I have looked at the guidebook, but um, is it just kind of like the recommendation is to have the CRMs and, and environmental team make sure this goes to the uh, command elements at their installations facilities that they need to, or is there going to be any type of other mechanism to distribute this 
um, wider in DOD to, to the other uh, people with roles and responsibilities at installations. Over. Thank you for that, Kristen. Um, we don't have a policy in place where we um, force people to pass this out. I think it's a great um, document, though, and so uh, we're certainly open to suggestions. Um, I, I know that the HIPWIG has, uh, I think they received a, a document um, and a notice, so we can certainly talk with the service leads, um, the cultural resource managers at the at the Historic Preservation Working Group and see if they're interested in, in making sure this gets out to folks. Um, um, so I guess if you have any thoughts on that, Kristen, I'd be happy to talk about that over. Uh, thank you. No, I think that um, if the HIPWIG wants to talk about that, I know that is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a little different for every service branch, but um, it is something that we always try to work on at Army National Guard um, to make sure that um, that's also going out to other uh folks that are engaged in the consultation process. So, um, you know, I think having this guidebook is, is a great tool that they can draw th uh, pieces from, even if they don't want to send the whole thing on to to other folks. But yes, I'd be I'd be looking I'd be interested in seeing if maybe there's like a revised or an abridged version that, you know, um, if the HIPWIC once thinks that's something worth pursuing or another type of legacy add on project product, I think that would be great. Over. Thank you for that. I'll make sure to share that with them and then um, we'll let you know what moves forward from that. Uh, so we had one question and one comment come in. Uh, Maria says, thank you for creating the guidebook. Any tools that assist in this process are greatly appreciated. Very useful with interagency and tribal work. Uh, Jennifer ask, asks, uh, does this guidebook provide guidance on how to continue relationships with tribes or is it more geared towards establishing a relationship? The, I think the major and Matt, are you there? And you might be frozen. I can't tell if you're just standing still or if you're frozen. Must be frozen. Um, I think the guidebook is centered towards uh, kicking off and starting conversations. Um, I think the the case studies that were provided by the services and and the language throughout is really good information, whether or not you are actively in consultation or coordination um, with a tribe. But it's also, um, I think that's, again, like we said, we think that's there's more, there's a need for something that's um, more focused on how to, uh, how to improve and continue with those relationships. So um, I guess if um, any of the uh, folks who wrote the document are on the line, they could speak to that, but, um, uh, but I don't know if that answers your question over. Jennifer Moss, if you are still on the line um, and if you didn't want to. Oh, she says yes, thank you. <laughs> um, if anybody else has any other um, questions or comments, you can please uh, come off a of mute or uh, if you're shy, you can easily type them in the chat. Kate, I don't know if the, you can answer this question, but how long um, was this legacy project to put it in perspective? It sounds like it took a while for this all to come together. Um, I think most legacy projects have a kind of a 12 month uh, uh, limit on it, which is part of the reason um, that there was so many uh, that the, pro the document can't be as robust as we wanted. I mean, you know, you'd like to cover everything you possibly could, but um, then you talk about like a 400 page document. So um, that was, I think, the biggest challenge is just that there's so much information to convey. And so, um, you know, we wanted to get started, but um, you want to avoid that over analysis where you are just paralyzed and you don't make a decision. So um, I think this is our first, um, I don't want to call it an attempt because I think it's a great document, but this is our first effort. And I think that there will be more efforts to come because um, as we've all alluded to, there's a lot of good information out there. And then um, and then there's a lot of very specific information that you really need to work regionally and, and with installation folks to get that good data in there and have it be um, specific 
to uh to to uh to everybody i guess <laughs> if that makes sense so um yeah over Lorraine asks, is the AICCC still in place? Are there any other training courses available? Um, it is still in place, and I think we might have Alicia Sylvester on the line. I'm not sure. Um, she had to do um, several other things while she was also uh, attending the webinar, as you guys are probably aware, she's busy as heck. So um, uh, yes, it is still available. There was just a training um in early june and i'm not sure when the next one is going to be available but i can check on that for you over actually terry kelly is here too she might know the answer uh, we we just had somebody uh wa ask what is what is a uh what is the a i c c uh c acronym <clears throat> Oh, I apologize. Sorry, I'm trying to get off mute. One second. Um, and Terry Kelly is here. Um, it's the there we go. Thank you. Um, at least the uh, Allison Rubio just posted the training in there. It's the American Indian Cultural Communication and Consultation course. Um, uh, that's offered by the Native American Affairs Group. One of the things that the cultural resource group is interested in is um, is is participating in that so we can add more of the specific section 106 kind of information. But um, uh, so that course does exist and it was just held. They had one in uh, April and Fallon and then they just completed um, training in Alaska, the American Indian consultation course in Alaska, the Alaska Native, sorry, cultural communications and consultation course. So. Um, the link that got posted, um, that's Terry Kelly, one of our great staff. Um, it's a really great if you guys have a chance to participate in these courses. I've attended the Native Hawaiian course. It was great and the team does a wonderful job. Uh, just for people who don't have access for or to the uh, chat um, box, um, the chat link or I'm sorry, I can't even think of what it's called off the top of my head anyway. Um, then there is more train. There is going to be another training in Hawaii in October, and then they're trying to get a core, uh, a training course in DC, hopefully in February. So uh, please keep an eye out for the those um, those training courses your way. Um, so another question came in. Presumably, this is geared towards engagement with federally recognized tribes. Is there any guidance for dealing with state tribes, particularly if there is a is a conflict between the federal and the state tribes? I am not aware of any um, guidance that we have right now. I mean, that's certainly an issue, and um, you know, same kind of situation in in Hawaii where you don't have um, federally recognized tribes. You have Native Hawaiian organizations. Um, we need specific guidance for both of those areas because they are so unique and they are so special. As well as in situations like California, where you have a lot of state recognized tribes. Um, we don't to answer your question no we don't have any but we certainly need some and i think that that's something that um if people need it that's that helps us uh advocate for um for funds to create that kind of guidance and to work with you guys um tribal liaisons and the services on making sure that that guidance is is accurate and um up to date and useful over uh, this is Mac Runewald. Uh, my connection just came back up. Uh, yeah, the relationship between state and federally recognized tribes was beyond the scope of this particular guidebook. But uh, uh, understand, uh, I understand what you're what you're asking, and and you know it, we are coming across that as well. Over. Eva asks, is this being distributed to external partners, for example, the FIPOs, or is it just internal with the DoD? This is Kate. Um, this is available. It'll be available um, to the public. It's going to be um, on the website, the Denix website that I think was posted in the chat. Um, if you guys don't have it, I think um, it might have been sent out in the um, in the invitation, but if not, we can get that out to you guys. Um, but yeah, it is intended to be a public facing document. Um, most legacy projects are 
are are uh, available to be viewed by the public um, unless there's a specific reason over. This is Jennifer Hardy. I just want to throw this out there for the people that were interested in training. Um, the Air National Guard is going to be hosting consultation training in September. Uh, it's not the AICCC training, but it is still consultation training. Um, and actually the TNTCX um, is one of the partners along with Indian and um, Native Pride and a couple others that put the training together for us. If we have space available, we are going to be opening it up to the wider DOD audience. So um, I'm going to put my email in the chat. And if you're interested, uh, feel free to email me and we will put you on the waiting list. And then if we do have space available, um, we'll send you an email and let you know that we have space. Hey Val, <laughs> um, it's primarily geared for Air Guard, but I mean, it, obviously it'll be applicable for everyone. So feel free to shoot me an email and um, it'll be at Andrews. I don't remember the week, but it'll it's in September. We haven't finalized everything yet, but we'll let you know. Thank you so much for that, Jennifer. That's very, uh, very generous of you. So I appreciate that. No problem. It's going to be great. <laughs> There you go, September 25th, the week of the 25th. Monday and Friday are travel days. So the training is the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, it also will include a trip to the um, Museum of the American Indian um, and then some pretty cool stuff in between. So it should be a really great training. I mean, I'm super excited about it. We're really excited about it at the Readiness Center. Well, wonderful. I'm happy to hear that. It sounds like it'll be good. So um, I'm, I would like it if I would like it. I hope that uh, that there's, I don't want to hope there's cancellations, but I hope some folks get to go. <laughs> <laughs> We have about a little over 10 minutes left to get a few more questions in and if anybody else would like to get um, questions or comments in. Kate, Matt, I have a question. How I, I you mentioned about the importance of this being a flexible, flexible document, and uh, how each tribe, um, tribal nation, has their own way, certain way of doing things. How important was that when establishing this document? Um, clearly, since it's in the book, but at the top of like a scale of one to ten, how important was that to make sure that that was in in the um in the uh, document you know it, jerry it, it's referenced uh, uh throughout the document especially in the establishing um you know do walking through a consultation meeting uh, that's why the the 
information in the guidebook is very, very general. Like it, it is up to the folks at the installation level to kind of to, you know, it says do your background research. Know that each tribe has its own history and its own uh, perspective on things. And, uh, you know, it's its own, um, you know, interactions that have, have happened between them and the DOD. Uh, so we, we tried to keep the um, recommendations as, as very general to start the conversation and to kind of move through the process of of getting to know, uh, you know, your the individual um, tribe um, and, and members, you know, who participate um, over there. So it's um it's going to be up to folks at the installation level to do that, um, but it is referenced in the guidebook um, the importance of establishing those relationships. Yeah, I would agree. Um, so much of uh, it's hard. You can't dictate consultation because it needs to be consultation and done in, in coordination and consultation and then partnership with tribes. And so Native Hawaiians, Alaska Natives. Um, so it can't it can't be dictated necessarily. So um, you want to provide as much information as possible, but without um, without forcing um, programs and policies and procedures that don't necessarily uh, conform with what the tribes need or want over. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Does the guide recommend participating in tribal conferences such as bridging the gap co-hosted by tribes and the USDA? I don't believe that they do, but it's not because there's no, um, I don't believe it's because there's a recommendation or a recommendation not to. Um, I I don't know, I guess I, I'm not super familiar with, um, with that uh, conference, so I can't speak to that in particular. It sounds like Kristen might be able to, but um, but I, I think a lot of, um, I, I think the idea of regional coordination with tribes amongst uh, more than one federal agency, in my opinion only, I think it's a great idea because um, rather than force the tribes to deal with the, you know, each individual federal agency, if we could get our coordination to line up and our partnerships to line up, I think that would be great. Um, that being said, I don't know about that. Um, I will let uh, maybe see if Kristen had an answer to that since she raised her hand. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, I was just going to add, I think, I don't think it's so much, I mean, I think anytime you can get some face time with tribes, but you have to be also respectful and understanding of like what that, what you might be attending. So if you're attending Bridging the Gap, which is primarily a conference workshop for U.S. Uh, for U.S. Forest Service and the uh, Southeast Regional Tribes, there, the bulk of that focus is going to be, you know, you can't really insert yourself into the meetings per se, they do have like days where you can sign up for like breakout groups, um, you know, and it's a good, it's a good way to sort of informally meet with um, tribal representatives because their time is pretty um, constrained and, and a lot of time you can at least just get yourself in there and sort of say hello because there's, you know, you're sitting in a big room going to classes. It's same thing with, you know, if you went to the NAP TIPO, um, the Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers Conference. That's open to agency folks to pay and attend. Um, and the American Associ what is it? Association of American Indian Affairs, um, I think, do I have that right? But anyways, they have a repatriation conference. You go to those things and you get yourself sort of, you network and sometimes there's tables, there's even networking uh, opportunities, but you, know, you have to be cognizant that you're not doing consultation. You're not you know, even if you have a breakout group, you're you're just sort of having an opportunity to to talk to them and maybe plan for a consultation or 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 get some face time. Um, and I can see one of my outstanding CRMs in Oklahoma has just put in the chat that bridging the gap is an as a good networking opportunity and sees and that's a good point. Eric mentioned seeing success stories. So um, me, that's what I think is is good about seeing those opportunities pop up over. That's Thank wonderful. you. Thank you. Uh, we just have enough time for one more question. Uh, Teresa asks, can we expect greater DOD slash military branch investment uh, monetary in related training in the near in the near uh, years, given 
the administration focus uh, focus on tribal consultation part of policies. Hey, so I'll take that one. I hope so. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I, I have no idea if it will. I certainly hope that it does. I think it's clear that the administration takes it seriously. I can tell you that my office, the Cultural Resource Program and, and Alicia Sylvester's office, um, the Native American Affairs Group, and as well as the Natural Resource and our, and our NEPA folks here, we all take it very seriously. Um, and we're certainly pushing from a from a policy level. It's It's best to to give money for training and give money for for participation and uh, we advocate for it, which is pretty much all we can do. I hope that it leads to some significant financial increases because um, I think we all on the line certainly agree that uh, the work that we do is important and um, with the large pushes for the Infrastructure Act and, and all the other um, uh, programs and policies that are coming out, we all know that it's going to put a lot of pressure on us as cultural resource folks. And so um, as well as tribal folks and, and state regulators. So I'm hoping that um, the increased attention brings increased funds. Thank you. Uh, I, I think with that, we'll end um, the presentation. Matt, thank you so much for doing this uh, presentation. It is a great topic. It is a, a very needed um, a needed document that we definitely need in the CR realm um, for consultation with the tribes. Again, this presentation is going to be posted on Dagnex um, under cultural resources and news and outreach uh, for any of you who were unable to see the slides. Um, the, also, the document, the guidebook is posted on Dagnex um, in the CR um, tab, so please look for it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, everybody have a great rest of your day. Bye.